This is the most important thing we'll ever do in our life is to build community, both for our personal lives and our professional lives. And I can't say it enough as an entrepreneur um, and as a, as a community member, it's been, it's been for me the, um, the greatest gift of my life. Thank you for that, Radha, bringing in uh, your principles to all of us here. And, and so now go ahead and yeah, talk so, a little about this journey and where you've gotten to be <laughs> you know, doing these kind of things in front of in front of the public and with an audience and members. Yeah. So, you know, maybe in the so in the chat, does anyone know Daybreaker? Have you heard of Daybreaker? Have you been? Have you danced at a Daybreaker? Um, it's an early morning dance community um, that uh, me and my team, we started eight years ago in New York City, really um, in what feels like a really dense city, but can be so deeply isolating um, and, and lonely. And so um, Daybreaker really began as a, uh, an interest in you know, starting your day with connection and community and dance. Daybreaker is an early morning dance community. We, so it starts your day in these wild locations like the Top of the World Trade Center, the White House, the Museum of Natural History, the Sydney Opera House, and all these amazing um, places around the world um, to really start your day with joy, dance, and connection without alcohol. So much of our joy and, and sort of social settings can be you know, kind of codependent to drinking and, and drugs. So the whole idea was, can we break that codependence and just learn to, to find joy and self-expression just from our own our own neurochemistry and through the connections in the morning. So um, yeah, Daybreak has been around for eight eight years now and the Oprah tour was, yeah, a really, um, a really amazing experience right before the pandemic. Um, and I think it really fueled us um, over the, the following 24 months after when the world shut down, one week after the Oprah tour ended. So that was a really wild experience. But um, yeah, the whole- yeah, I do, you know, I, There are a couple, there have been a you know comment, someone in the Q&A was talking about being part of the, the AARP session that you ran. Oh, so. yay. Oh, that's great. Yeah, AARP, this, this, yeah, really, you know, the online community piece has been such an also, and we'll get into that, but just like I had such prejudice against online experiences but then I realized actually there's so much beauty in um, and, and intimacy and you're now seeing my home. I'm seeing, you know, we get to see each other's homes. There's an intimacy and a connection to that invitation. And there's also um, an opportunity for those who are our master citizens who might not be able bodied enough to wake up and go to a dance party somewhere they could now sort of join and be part of the community online. So really offering the opportunity to connect and convene um, where people are. So that was a beautiful key learning as well. Yeah, so. So what talk about, right? This is, you know, uh, maybe dash of your personal journey to get to this point, but how that led to these strategies of like the strategies around that you've sort of been developing over about this community building. Yeah, so, you know, people always ask me, you know, how do we build Daybreaker? We spent zero dollars in marketing. We grew to 30 cities around the world. We're a community of 500,000 members who are all about bringing joy and wellness and dance. So like imagine a wellness world and nightlife world coming together and making a baby. And I think that it took fire because these two universes were so ripe for expansion, but no one was really bringing them together. Um, so I think really, you know, right place, right time, but also creating really, really thoughtful, intentional um, ingredients for community architecture. So, um, you know, maybe throw up in the chat, usually I'll do a show of hands, but I can't see you, but throw, throw up in the chat, you know, was there ever a moment or is there a moment right now where you're looking to build community or are you building community for your business or for your personal life? Um, what city are you in? You know, maybe just share in the chat something that um, that you're experiencing right now post pandemic around community. Um, and I can sort of I'll run you through sort of my uh, method for community building that might be really helpful for you as you create your community for your um, for your um, your life and your business, so yeah, maybe just like throw up an emoji. Are you are you creating community right now for your business or your life? Um, would love to see um, just some connection. It's always hard to to converse <laughs> in these spaces, and I think the chat is a wonderful way to connect. Yeah, it's beautiful. There we go. Some hands coming up, and okay. some not really. Right, it's a challenge. Yeah. Right, it's 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 not not an easy instinctive thing. Yeah, great. So someone from Seattle, new business development, great. South Florida, community building is a social 
gerontologist. Yes, intergeneration. That's so much of what I love. Um, the Fuller Project. Um, yes, building soaring worlds. Cool. Strength community. Health and equity. Kids in STEM. Ice water lake plunging in Minneapolis. Love that. More inclusive <laughs> undergrad recruiting job banking. Right. Love this. Women entrepreneurs in New York City. Let's go. Um, loneliness amongst university students. Oh gosh. Yeah, that's such a big, a big, big piece of this. So, okay, so a lot of good, good, good participation here. Thank you. By the way, 90% um, of community building is around showing up fully and participation. So part of this exercise that we're doing today here with Matt is really about inviting you to courageously express yourself. I think so much of the world of belonging can be very like waiting for someone to come to you rather than being like, all right, I'm 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 being prompted, let's go. I'm gonna write in and, and, and really go for it. So really 90% of, of belonging starts with you showing up and, and being courageous about it, courageous you know, whose gerund starts with cœur, the heart. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just to kind of um, take a little bit of a 10,000 foot view back um, or up higher, you know, when I turned 30, I looked myself in the mirror and I realized I didn't belong and that I'd spent my 20s really sleepwalking through life and sort of living for what society would want for me. And it was a very, very lonely experience. Um, and and so, um you know, so so that was the beginning of this sort of question of like, okay, how do I reprioritize my life? You know, how many of us spend all of our time, um, you know, really thinking about our romantic relationships and writing down dreaming of like that person that we're going to marry or that person we're going to make a family with? Like we spend so much time doing that. We spend so much time, show of hands, um, thinking about our careers, what we want to do with our lives. Like there's so much intention, effort, and brain space that goes into these two areas of our life. But who has spent the time writing down what qualities you're looking for in a friend, right? So the first exercise I did in my personal life was just like, not just wait for that person to come to me or not just like think about it, but write it down on a piece of paper three columns and it's in my book belong i have about 20 exercises in the book um but but the this is the one of the first exercises in the book which is column one what are the qualities you're looking for in a friend like really like take the time and write it down not romantic relationship but in a friendship i want a friend who loves to listen and take walks and go on adventures i want a friend who i can just say hey there's a party happening tomorrow want to go with me and she'll say f yeah i'm going right like what are the qualities you're looking for in a friend Column two, what are the qualities that you don't want in a friend? Being really, really careful about that. I don't want shoulder shruggers, negative Nellies, friends who are grandfathered in, friends that I, you know, that I, I've known for so long that I feel bad saying goodbye, but they're so, they bring me down every time I hang out with them. Write down those qualities that you don't want in a friend. Column three, maybe the most important column, what are the qualities that you need to embody, that we each need to embody in order to attract and magnetize the friends? of our dreams. And that was this beginning blueprint for me to really write down and go on the path of personal looking under the hood of what I needed to do to be ready and magnetize because often the friends that we magnetize is the energy that we're putting out. So scared energy magnetizes insecure friendships. Um, you know, fearful um, negative energy magnetizes also fearful negative friendships. So like, how do we work on ourselves first to really magnetize joyful friends who really see your win as their win? So um, so that was the first exercise I did. And then I, there's like a lot of other things, you know, what are my values today? A little via chart, what are my values today? What are my interests today? And what are my abilities, a VIA, a VIA, values, interests, and abilities. So there's so many different exercises that we could do around understanding where we are in our personal journey today, because me as a mother today is my values are different than what I, what they were 10 years ago when I was single on the prowl and having fun and just, you know, like running around the world. Um, so, so that's like sort of the personal looking inside, going inward, right? That's the first half of the journey. But then for all of those who are, since we have very little time today, um, I just want to give you a little bit of an amuse-bouche, you know, for, for the going out piece, which I think will be really helpful for what I'm seeing everyone's trying to build, whether in school, in university, um, or, or in your communities at large. Um, so it's a method. So I, so I was asked by, 
you know, many, many different, um, you know, I got hundreds of emails over the course of, of the last eight years from people who want to build community. And they're like, right away, meet me for coffee. Can we have lunch? Can we have a Zoom? You know, and I would do that, but one hour coffees were never enough. So I was like, all right, let me really think about what what is the method? How can I really distill all that all that I learned in the community building space to to distill it into a method? So I call it the crawl method and um, the crawl method for community building. Um, and essentially, the reason why the acronym is called crawl is because community takes time to build. We have to be patient. We have to be courageous. It took me three years from 30 to 33 years old for me to actually build my community. It took me three years to find one friend at a time, to introduce them, to create dinner parties, like all of that to really create a burgeoning community in New York City. Um, so, so being really patient to crawl and not run, that's the most important thing. And so much of the world of marketing is, is trying to run, like putting ad dollars in your vein and having to spend more and spend more and spend more on Facebook ads because you haven't taken the time to build an, a foundational community to support your your product or service right so the crawl method write this down um, is an acronym for community building right so the c in crawl I'll start with that really i'll run you through them all and matt feel free to cut me off if you have questions and in, in between um You're running great <laughs> okay great awesome so i'm, I'm gonna go fast because i really want this to be high octane for everyone because this is the most important thing we'll ever do in our life is to build community both for our personal lives and our professional lives and i can't say it enough as an entrepreneur um and as a as a community member it's been it's been for me the um the greatest gift of my life um so the c is defining your constraints in your community what are the constraints of the community that you're trying to build so if if um if yours is trying to build a, an inclusive undergrad recruiting, um, you know, experience in banking, right? Um, you're, the the constraints are people in the finance world, uh, 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 you know, people who live in New York City. Um, you know, constraints are you know sort of th those types of things. Like right? those are examples of constraints for Daybreaker. The constraints where we are a sober community. I mean, like I'm not so I have like a glass of wine and whatever, but like Daybreaker itself is a sober dance space so anyone who's not who's sober can feel safe there anyone who's not sober sober can also feel safe there as well um but we're our constraints are we're sober we're, we're sober dance community we are an early morning community so if you're not a, a morning person it might not be a you know a place for you although they say that being a morning person makes you more optimistic and more successful anyway we can get into that later um and then constraints can be things like price like louis vuitton handbags it's like very expensive so the constraint is you have to want to spend money on these things or a constraint can be that they're a heritage brand rather than a more german design right a, a louis vuitton handbag I'm, I'm making this up but it's like that's a that's an example of a of a heritage brand that might not be my aesthetic so constraints are really guardrails that allow your community members to think about do i belong here does this feel good for me um so really defining those thoughtfully is super important um, the second thing is um, designing your container. The C is a container. What is the space? So I define community as a space in which you experience belonging. So belonging is the feeling. Community is the space in which you experience belonging. So what is the container that you're creating for your community? Is it a Zoom community? In which case, how are you actually really allowing this 2D environment to be as connected as possible, right? If it's a 3D meetup space, okay, what is the container of that? When someone enters the space, how are they greeted? What are, are their candles lit? What what's written on the walls? What are the how does the lighting in this space like? Like the container is so crucial in how you invite in um, and build community. Um, um, and then and then, um, who is your core community? That's the other C. There's four C's in the in the in the crawl method. Who is your core community? So at Daybreaker, I spent the first two days when I sort of dreamt up the idea with my with my partner, my co-founder, um, we spent two days debating over who would be the first friends you would invite to, um, to Daybreaker because that container, that core community 
that's going to kickstart, that's going to be the kindling to start your community is so critical. You can't have negative Nellies and shit talkers and people who are like waking up early on a weekday morning to dance sober, you know, before going to work. Like, I'm not doing that. That's the dumbest idea I've ever heard, right? Like, that's a lot of people that you didn't want to invite, right? And so, the friends that I did invite that ended up being like friends and friends of friends and, and whatever, that I could just think of 300 people in New York City. Um, this by the time I was 35, I'd spent five years building my community. So I really knew a lot of people who would be a FYF in my book, I call that, sorry if this is university, but FYF stands for fuck yeah friend. Um, so I was gonna be like, fuck yeah, I'll try that. Like FYF, I'll try that, F yeah, I'll try that. And like, someone who's gonna be like leaning in and saying, wake up early in the morning, sober, dance, great, I'm in. You know, that's a core community member that you want on your team, right? So core community is so critical in designing and defining your launch of your community. So as you do, as you think about your community at your university where you experience loneliness, really first start by doing like a nice audit of your friends, of, of your classmates around you and think about who would be an FYF, who would be down to do a walk-in club or whatever, some some moment of connection. Um, so that's the, 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 the C. The last C in the crawl method is defining your core values. What are the core values of your community? And so Daybreaker, even before our first event, it was a social experiment. We didn't care. We were like, our core values, we're going to define them, even if we if this succeeds or not. Let's have it written down. So our core values are wellness, camaraderie, self-expression, mindfulness, and mischief. And these five core values are the values that we think about for any community member we invite, any sponsor that we invite into the equation, et cetera, et cetera. All right, I'm gonna run through the rest and they're much faster. The R in the crawl method is your ritual. What are the rituals in your community, right? In sports teams, you're chanting the things, you know, right? Like at church, you're reading the Bible together, right? Like what are the rituals of your community? At Daybreaker, you're greeted at the door, not by a bouncer looking up and down or by someone on an iPad checking you in, but we greet you with a hugging committee whose mission is to just hug you and welcome you and make you feel so joyful. Post COVID, we have a compliment committee instead, but um, um, but anyway, so so there's a lot of things that you can do to make it really um, special. The ritual of entering a space, the ritual of exiting the space, rituals inside the space. How can you invite ritual into your meetings, into your university, into your any experience that you're trying to develop? How can you actually invite more ritual in? And that's up to each and every one of you listening, not just to wait for it to happen, but to really courageously create it, right? So that's super, super important. And even if you might have some people like, I don't be part of this, great, do you, thank you, high five, but courageously keep going, right? And keep trying and keep trying. It took me three years, five years to start Daybreaker, right? Um, so ritual, how do you invite a ritual into your community? The A in the crawl method is defining your aesthetics. We live in an Instagram filter world. Everyone cares about typography, filter, language, and then the way things look. So really taking care on as you launch your first community, really thinking about, okay, if I'm not a visual gifted person. Let me find someone in my community that or that I know that's good at graphic design, that's good at picking things, mood boards on Pinterest, so I can really make a splash with my invitation when I send the first invite out for my community or I create a website, really thinking about what are the colors of your community? What are the aesthetics? What are the fonts? What does the web experience look like? What does the entire 3D experience look like, right? The aesthetics, like at Daybreaker, we always have you know, um, food and beverage that you can grab and go. We have beautiful decorations around. We The aesthetics of our experience, both in the invitation and the 3D experience is so deeply thoughtful. Our social media, all of it is so, so carefully curated and, um, and loved on. So aesthetics are crucial, especially in the 21st century. And if you notice like most YMCA websites, their websites look like they're built in 1992. They all look horrible. So like, the reason why people don't want to go to YMCA's anymore is because no, YMCA's mostly don't care about the aesthetics of the way their community looks and no one wants to join something that's not pretty, right? So really taking care of that as you grow your community. L little different in the burbs, Rada. You know, the why is 
just like I love the why because they offer before yeah, okay, after, great. for my kids and whatever right so it's some sometimes it's the aesthetics is the fit of your location and your community right it's totally like, oh yeah 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 and I'm not and I'm not like I'm totally yeah, not, no, I, you're not just the I love YMC I love it if I were to <laughs> consult with them and I were to support them I would say hey let's update your website let's update the aesthetics let's make it more current you'll get way more people you know so so I just think that I, I'm a huge proponent of the why yeah, I just, yeah. I just don't think that the aesthetics of the why are 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 21st century. <laughs> um, and then the W in the crawl method is your why. So I have five W's in my book. Like, why are you the person to lead this community? Like, really, like prop yourself up. Like, show your show off for yourself. Write it down. Like, why am I the person to do this thing? Or maybe I'm number two. I think it's a courageous, most courageous person is like, hey, I'm really good at organizing things, but maybe this person should be like the front face because they're more like, you know, kind of galvanizing and, and are, are open. I can learn from them in the process. So knowing where you sit in the hierarchy of community architecture is so, so critical. Where are, where are you? Are you the front facing? Are you the organ? Are you the producer? Where do you sit in, um, in, in that space? So why is this community also viable over time? Why is someone going to continue wanting to come? Daybreakers, eight years old you know um studio, studio 54 was 18 months though everyone still talks about it because it was such an epic community but like how can you how can you actually create a community that stands the test of time ymca being a good example of one that did um but but how can you why is this community viable over time why is this community financially viable as well? Like, what are the ways in which we make money at Daybreaker? We do that through ticket sales. We do that through sponsorships. We, we do that with memberships. We have Daybreaker Plus memberships. You can join our community and we all connect with each other and really like deepen um, our connection around joy, practicing joy with each other. So like, that's the way our community is financially viable as well, right? So the W in the, in the crawl method. The L in the crawl method is your language. What is the language of your community? So often we try to be so business professional that we forget that we're speaking to humans. So the reason why Daybreaker has been, I think, very successful is that our language style has been, again, so thoughtful. Our avatar is a millennial minded, not millennial, I'm not millennial, but millennial minded, um, intellectually funny person. Um, so like, like, so that's sort of our avatar that we write. So someone who's like, likes to intellectual humor, someone who, you know, loves to put emojis and gifts on the page. So our community members tell me this all the time. They love opening our emails because they're so fun to read. They learn something new every time they read it. And there's so much visual candy that it just like is something exciting. So the language of the way we speak to our community is so, so important. So that's the crawl method in a nutshell. <laughs> So of course, when we started this discussion, Rod, I was like, yeah, fireside chat, that's good. Uh, rather than a keynote, and of course, it just flows out of you <laughs> so naturally, um, partly because you are you so passionate about it, doing this for so long. In fact, I think we, we have very few questions of you, which is good because we're down to the last couple of minutes. And the reason I like that is because I think everyone was writing down, it was kind of, you were answering the questions in the, providing this cool toolkit for everyone, which is just fantastic. So um, I'd like to kind of leave on the end here uh, before we slide on to, to Keith Grossman, our next speaker, with um, a little of the metrics around, right? A lot of what you're doing, Rod, is it's, it's social and it's all businesses are working on metrics, measurement, how are we making an impact? How are we gauging what our impact is? Mm -hmm. We're looking at sustainability. Social impact enterprises, which is what Daybreaker is, right? Even more challenging. How do we show this authenticity that we are truly trying to do something like our mission is about societal improvement? How are we proving it? Can you talk about anything you're doing in that area? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, first of all, so much of the world today is data driven, right? And it's so much of the world today looks at data. And, and of course, like we're working with the Greater Good Science Center and UC Berkeley to really measure our impact. And we're, we're launching a comprehensive study on um, the science of joy, the science of dance. We're gonna be really, there's so many new tricks to be able to measure, um, you know, measure, um, you know, impact before and after, measure impact around community. Um, but I, I think one of the biggest to me, um, 
paths and opportunities for companies to look at things is that so again like we everything is so data driven that we're not actually thinking about the social side of things right so it's like um what is it the the uh, the data insights versus human insights you know you look at so many companies and it's like they have a huge 50 person data insights team but they literally don't have a human insights team right so it's like i think that there is a place for both in any conversation. I think data is a beautiful way to like measure and understand, but I think that can be overly simplified. And I think we really need to pay more attention to human insights as we begin to cross pollinate the two to create a much more human experience, a human world to live in. I think the more data we are, the more robotic VR we are, and the less, the less, you know, the less connected and sent and 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 sensorial um we are so that that requires a lot more nuance does that answer your question it's great yeah you mentioned it and you're it's an interesting thing in the you know decade plus that we've been running bright to see this sort of pendulum swing around sort of data and you know human instincts and those kind of things and i think it's beginning the resonance of we need to get in that middle or where we're getting both the data and the human and we need to meld them mm -hmm. is really happening. So I think that's a great endpoint, uh, Rada. I wish we, it's always the challenge of every conference organizer yeah. is the minute you get into stimulating docs, you wish you had twice the time you did, <laughs> but you got a program, you're programming for a whole range of things and ideas and different things for different audiences. So it's been great to have you, Rada. We'll, 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 this won't be the last time we involve you in something, you know, at Columbia and Columbia Business School. So thank you again for being here. Let's give Rada a virtual round of applause, everyone. Thank you and, all um, for being here. And I want to just yes. honor you and commend you for, um, for creating this and for really, again, it takes courage to do this and to bring everybody, galvanize everyone. So challenge for everyone is to do the type of thing that Matt is doing and create your own community, create your own opportunity for gathering. Um, and life gets more exciting. <laughs>